space. So today, I thought it would be good that we could look from a biblical perspective at how we handle crisis in our lives. So we know that uh, whether it be in our personal lives, in our married life, family life, school life, in, um, in culture, no matter where it is, uh, we all face different kinds of anxieties and different kinds of uh, struggles and crisis in our life. How do we uh, approach them and what are some tools that we can find that will enable us uh, to move forward with a sense of uh, hopefulness? Yeah. So today we had listened to the Psalm reading, Psalm 13. And so uh, perhaps today we can look at it from a biblical perspective and next time we can, uh, when we get, uh, we'll look at it again, but we'll revisit it using um, a fresh set of tools um, from, from a therapeutic approach. And that will also shed light on the same uh, challenge that we all face. The Psalmist in this passage in Psalm chapter 13 is, um, it's attributed to David and so we know that David is a person who went through many different kinds of struggles. We're not sure exactly what struggle in, in this particular case he's referring to, but we know that it's pretty intense. What do we do when we go through the difficult parts of our life? Or first of all, how do we even interpret those parts of our lives? I just realized that no one else has their video on. Um, makes it very difficult. <laughs> oh, good. Thank you, thank you. Uh, it's a lot more helpful. Yeah, so now I, I know that it's, uh, you know, in our church, there's a practice after the Reformation that we don't serve communion if there's no one there to receive it. And I don't like giving a message unless we know that there are people listening. <laughs> so good that at least you all were kind enough to turn on your videos. So there are phases in our lives that we all go through. There are the positive times and experiences in our lives. When we go through those kinds of experiences, it's very easy to turn to God and trust and hope in him because everything is going smoothly. When things are going smoothly, we love praying to a God of steadfast uh, support, uh, our rock and our comforter, our redeemer. When that phase of life ends, and it always does, the next question is, what do we do? See, the psalmists encapsulate all experiences of life, the times in life where things are steady and smooth, the times of life when things are difficult, and then the time when we come out of the difficulty. Psalm 1, Psalm 8, Psalm 119. These are all great Psalms that talk to us about the calm, steady assuredness that we have in God in times that are fine. But then Psalm 13, like the one that we just listened to, Psalm 55, Psalm 69, Psalm 88, Psalm 137. These are all Psalms that talk about a very dark time in a person's life. The first thing that we learn is we address these dark times by going to God. Now, that seems kind of counterintuitive if you don't have faith. If you don't have faith, uh, this is exactly where the atheist will step in and say, see, there can't be a God because all these bad things are happening. But for the person of faith, we say that when we do go through difficult times, we trust or we're supposed to trust more in God. And so the psalmist turns to God, but look at how he turns to God. It's not immediately this absolute rock hard uh, certainty that God is with him. There are a set of questions in Psalm chapter 13, verse one. How long, O Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? We don't usually like to talk like this, or at least we don't advise our children to talk like this when they talk to God or, or even when they talk to us. How long will it take for you to come and listen to me and 
you're always busy and you never listen to what I'm saying. And when our kids tell us that, we get very frustrated with them. And we're like, no, I'm here uh, or I'm busy. I'm doing something or we get upset that they don't trust us, that we'll get to it when there's time. But here the psalmist isn't complaining or whining. He's turning to the one person who has the responsibility in this world to make things right. See, some people, when they face difficult periods in their lives, they will turn to alcohol or they will turn to inward, right? They will turn and become more selfish and self-preserving and caring only about themselves. Some people will cower in fear. Some people will just run to the nearest person who gives them any tiny fraction of attention. And that's really dangerous if you're a young one at an age when you're very impressionable. Here, the biblical writer teaches us that when these difficult times come, right? So there's the, the, there's the green pastures and the still waters, but then when God leads us through the valley of the shadow of death, we cling on to and we turn first to God. Um, the whole theology of prayer is wrapped up in the idea that I am addressing the only one who has a means of changing the situation that I'm in. And when we pray, what are we saying? We're saying, we're making this declaration. So even when the words that come out of our mouth are colored by the emotions that we are currently experiencing, the very fact that we're still coming to God is a sign of our faith. And so you, you, another thing that we learn about this is you don't have to be prim and proper in times of distress. Job, Job went so far as to say that he curses the day that he was born, that it would have been better if he were still born. Job goes so far as to blame God for the situation that he's in, right? If an Achin starts a sermon by blaming God, you would think that you might think because of the way that we've been trained to, to think that that's not a faithful way of talking. But the biblical writers are telling us, no, this is real faith. Real faith is being genuine with your heavenly father, with not trying to cover things up and not trying to be stronger than you need to be, but to come broken before him and say, where are you? I'm reminded of the time when um, Martha and Mary lost their sibling, Lazarus. And you know how the story goes. They run to Jesus and Martha is saying, Lord, if only you were there. It almost sounds like an accusation as if it's your fault. But it also, on the other hand, is a clear affirmation that you could have, you do have the power to make a change. And Jesus affirms it by saying, I am the resurrection and the life, right? So here... When we go through difficult times, turn to God and just pour out your heart to him. Modern Christianity is so fixated with what the world views as pretty. And we want to be pretty Christians. We want to be safe and strong Christians. We don't like to show that we are going through difficult times. But the psalmists, the genuineness that the psalmists portray here tell us that that prim and proper and pretty Christianity has no place in a genuine relationship with God. When your kids come home and you look at their face and you can tell that they're disturbed and you ask them, what happened? How are you? How would you feel if your child said, oh, I'm fine? everything was okay. You know, you know that everything is not okay. You want them to say, mommy, daddy, it was a terrible day. This happened, this happened, this happened. I wish you could have seen what was going on in the school ground or in the classroom. I wish you were there and maybe you could have done something about it. But that's what we want to hear. That means that our children have an open relationship with us and they can be free with us. That's what we see. 
the psalmist doing with God? And he goes on in verse two, how long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? You know, as an engineer, we're taught uh, to be problem solvers. And in order to be good problem solvers, uh, there's one very simple um, quality that we need to have. And that mean, that is that we have to be good problem identifiers, right? If you cannot identify the problem, you will not be able to solve it. And so there's a lesson that's being taught here of articulating what the problem is and bringing that very specific problem to God. Now, sometimes I know that it's difficult to understand the full picture. And sometimes we don't know exactly what the problem is, but then say that to God. God, the problem is I don't know where to begin. But now you've started somewhere. Now you've pointed out something that needs to be addressed within the field of psychology or within the field of uh, biblical narrative. It's when we speak these things out to God that these things become issues that need to be dealt with. As long as it's tucked away in our mind or hidden away in our heart, we don't deal with these issues. This is why we pray that we would be exposed before God. We see that God sometimes will have to shine the light onto us so that we can see the real problem. But the exposing and the identifying of the problem is the first step towards experiencing the solution. And so it's okay and it's in fact necessary to say, Father, I'm going through a time of depression right now. Or Father, I'm struggling to love right now. Or Father, I'm having a particular addiction in my life right now. How long do I have to wrestle with this? By pinpointing and bringing it before God, you're admitting that you're ready to face it that you are no longer being ignorant of the thing that God already knows, by the way. And you're ready to allow God to open up and help you uh, walk through it and deal with it. In verse 3, uh, the psalmist goes on to say, Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes, or I will sleep the sleep of death. And my enemies will say, I have prevailed, my foes will rejoice because I'm shaken. So let's look at that first uh, part, verse three. An consider and answer me, O God. Consider and answer me, O God. Give light to my eyes. Now, in English, there is a, a way in which you can say a sentence that uh, makes it a question, right? Um, there is a way in which you can say a sentence that just makes it simply a sentence. And there's a way you can say a sentence that makes it a command. And then there's a way in which you can say it that makes it a um, what's called a jussive. It's uh, a little less than a command. It's you're, you're giving permission to something. That's interesting. Um, for those who were with us in the, our Genesis series is another thing, uh, one of the million other things that we didn't talk about. Let there be light. Let the sky be separated from above and, and the waters above and the waters below. There, God is not using the commandment language. He is using the permission language. And so that tells you that God doesn't, he just tells things, but he is not demanding. And you get a, a picture of God's character from just the very first chapter. Oh, this God isn't like those other gods who forces things on us. Um, he calls us to participate with him. He calls all creation to obey by way of submission. And here, though, the point is here, consider, answer, give light. These are not polite ways of requesting. The way the grammar is worded here in Hebrew, these are all commands. And these are commands given by the psalmist to God. And that's a strange thing, isn't it? that the psalmist would have the audacity to tell God what to do. Now, on the surface of it, 
it seems like that's certainly not a good thing to do. You should be humble before God. Uh, in Ecclesiastes, we had talked about this in another setting. The writer teaches us that when you enter into the presence of God, keep your words few. Certainly, certainly, that means don't walk in there and start ordering him around or bossing him around. But the way the grammar is set up here forces us to think differently now. What is it about this relationship between the psalmist and God that gives him the right to address him in such a way? But there are times when you have a close enough relationship with someone that you can be frank with them. You can be a little blunt with them. I know that uh, if a bishop comes into our midst, everyone would speak to him extremely politely. Um, but I have seen times when a, a, a sibling of a bishop will be so, uh, you know, at one with the, the bishop because they have that established relationship, they can just tell them, no, 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 you need to do this. And the bishop will say, yes, of course. Not that there was any impoliteness, but it meant that the relationship was so close that that was allowed for. And then the other thing that we have to listen to, this isn't the kind of, I come home from work, go get me a cup of coffee kind of command. This is a plea. This is, I am drowning. You have to save me now. That's the way it's phrased. That's the spirit in which it's spoken out. And so when we address God in prayer, in times of crisis, we can address him to a degree with humble boldness. Jesus later on says, oh, you know, those who are followers would be able to address God as father and say, Right? And then he goes on to say, like, the concept of being so close to God as to call him father was almost like blasphemy within the Jewish tradition, because you don't get to assume that you are so close to God. But Jesus was teaching us that you can be. And, and words like this from the psalmist teach us that, oh, man, there must be some special connection, a, a certain closeness that is available to us that gives us the opportunity now to really ask him for that desperate thing that we need. Now, with everything, there's always a balance. And sometimes he gives it to us immediately. Sometimes he doesn't. Here, it's almost as if he's asking God to act because God's name and honor is on the line, right? Consider me, answer me, oh my, oh Lord, my God, give light to my eyes, or I will sleep the sleep of death. Father, if you don't intervene, there is no hope. If you don't take action in my life and help me overcome this addiction, what hope is there? Because I can't do it on my own. And so, Father, you have to show that you are who you say you are and help come and intervene into my life. And this is the kind of language, right, that he says, my foes will rejoice because I am shaken. If, if God, if you don't, if you don't inter intervene, the world won't know you like I know you. They'll think that you're incapable. But it then now becomes a way of being showing our own lives as a testimony of what God does. This is not a manipulation of the situation. This is an understanding that his life and his struggle itself is part of the grand message of what God is doing in this world. Now, this also gives us a huge perspective change. If I think that the world and my problem is all about me, I will want God to revolve around me. But if I recognize that I am part of God's story, then, then the motivations all change. Father, Father, don't let my life become an example for others to then not trust in you. How can we, in times of crisis, live a life that convinces other people that we have a solid hope? 
Well, it's by always trusting. And that's what then ends up happening in the very next verse. Now, we don't know how long the gap is between verse 4 and verse 5. And when we read Psalms, or when we read the Bible in general, we have a habit of rushing through it. You know how the Lord's Prayer sounds in your own home. You know how the Nicene Creed sounds when we come to the church. Everyone is in a rush. I don't know where we're going or what we want to do with the rest of our day. But sometimes we need to slow down. Life does not speed up. Every second takes the same amount of time. And sometimes there will be a long period between our painful experiences and the restoration that God has in store for us. Don't be in such a rush to ignore all the lessons that God is teaching us in between. I don't know how long it took, but eventually he says in verse five, but I trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. In fact, when you reread verse six, five and six, you can't be sure that he's out of the situation that he first describes. Because he says, I trusted in your steadfast love and my heart shall rejoice and I will sing because you have dealt bountifully with me. We're not 100% sure about what's going on in the present, but you know what? If we can have the eyes of faith and a sharp enough memory of faith to be able to look back and see how God has dealt with us and been with us, then we should be able to move forward in hopefulness, continuing to rejoice, continuing to say, I will sing, even though I haven't fully experienced what I hope to experience. And this is, this is the model that the biblical writer gives for us, at least in this psalm. And I think this is very powerful for us. I don't know when your struggle will end. It might be tomorrow, God willing, it'll be sooner rather than later. But we do know this. If you look back, you'll be able to find a hundred reasons to continue to trust in God. If you look back, you'll find plenty of reasons to keep on singing. You don't need this one solution to convince you that God is who he says he is. And so this becomes our testimony. The fact that you have a broken person who's still clinging on to Christ, clinging on to God, that becomes a very powerful testimony to a world. How do you stay so sure when you are going through this in your life? And then you tell them. You tell them who your anchor is, who your rock is. So hopefully this gives us a model of not shying away from being genuine, from being authentic, of bringing our pain directly to God the Father, of being bold enough to pinpoint the problems in our lives, of being able to have the close enough relationship with him where we can plead and to some degree demand that he be God and that he act out his godliness in our lives. And as we wait, for God to reveal himself, as he always will in his time, we reflect on how we can trust in him and how we can continue to worship him as we go forward. And by doing so, the world will be profoundly struck by our character and witness. And that'll be the opportunity for us to tell them about who is our source of hope in this world. So may the good Lord strengthen us, no matter what situation in our personal marital or family life we're going through, God has given us the tools and he's given us the person to address. May God be with us. Um, uh, next time when we meet, we'll revisit this whole thing again, but from a different angle. And we'll find, this is the biblical theological foundations of everything. And I think this is immensely practical, but we'll take one more step towards practicality in the next class. And we'll look at Exact, actual ways in which we can manage our anxiety and our stress and uh, cope in times of crisis.